Welcome to the Sober Vibes Podcast. I'm your host, Courtney Anderson. I decided to end my decade-long love affair with alcohol in 2012 at 29 years old. I chose to live openly as a recovering alcoholic with honesty and humor while figuring it out one day at a time. This space will bring you weekly episodes of my own personal experiences with my addiction and sobriety, as well as me interviewing incredible souls who are living life without drugs and alcohol. This podcast is here to inspire you, empower you, uplift you, and bring you some laughter along the way in your own journey. Sit back, relax, and let's have a time. Hey, welcome to the Sober Vibes Podcast. I'm your host and sober pal, Courtney Anderson. You are listening to episode 92. I hope wherever you are today, you are having a kick-ass day. And if you're not having a kick-ass day, that's okay. If you just got up and brushed your teeth and washed your face today and that's all you had to give, I'm giving you a high five and a hug because some days that's all any of us have to give. It's just a toothbrush and a face wash and that is it. So thank you for tuning in today. If you have not already, please rate, review, and subscribe to the show. Those ratings and reviews help out. I love our topic today. I love our guest today. If you notice, there's a theme in the month of May 2022, and I wanted to group these two conversations with guests because it's about sex. And if you haven't listened to episode 89, that was in the beginning of the month with Brianne Davis, we talk about love and sex addiction. And I just am fascinated by that addiction. And today I have guest Cindy Roberts, who is a certified recovery coach, sexual health educator, and a professional speaker. And she's breaking down how to approach intimacy early on in your sobriety. My sister and I tried to talk about this in season one of the Sober Rise podcast and the Living on the L Edge series, but my sister and I, I mean, we don't have any professional background of this and we're just kind of two animals. So this is why I wanted to have Cindy on to bring her knowledge and her education with sex to this podcast to help you if this is a troublesome topic because it is for so many of us. It was certainly for me that first year of sex was terrifying and it was hard. And I was even with somebody, you know, and in still being with somebody a year and a half previous and then getting sober. I mean, it's huge because sober sex is crazy. (laughs) And it's scary the first couple of times. And even it takes a while to get used to your own body. And, and for me, it took a while not to use sex as a weapon. And there's so many layers. There's so many, so many, so many layers. So I'm glad Cindy is here again with her knowledge to drop the bombs for you. Always let me know what you think of the show too. Two announcements before we get started. If you have not tried, our sponsor is Organifi. It's a supplement company. They are amazing. I wanted to add in, they just released, because it's seasonal, the Organifi Glow. And that is a collagen support. So it's great for the skin. Definitely too, since we were you know, dehydrated for so long. It's definitely a good choice for you. It tastes like pink lemonade. I was crushing it last summer just because I, in my pregnancy, I mean that I had a lot of cravings for tart and again, pink lemonade, sweet and tart and delicious. So I highly recommend you checking it out. The link is below. Remember you can save 20% off with the code sober vibes. So it is back and that is seasonal. So it will be here through the summertime. Also last week, I decided I was going to start my eight week group coaching program on the 23rd, but I actually pushed it back to start on the 31st. So that was a decision I wanted to make because to get past and over with Memorial Day. I understand it's always a good time. Today is a perfect day for you to start your sobriety journey, but I just felt like pushing that back that extra week and getting through the holiday weekend 
worked well for many. So if you haven't heard about my next level sober support eight week coaching program, you will spend eight weeks with me. Once a week, we'll have a a zoom. There'll be eight meetings. You will get Voxer access to me Monday through Friday. Now this is something that I do with my one-on-one clients. And so this group coaching program is my one-on-one program that I have condensed down into a group coaching program. I'm only going to run this about twice a year, if that. So if you need help in your sobriety journey and are looking for a sign that, you know, maybe you've done all the things and it is not working, but you need that accountability and support. This program is for you. The link is in the show notes. Feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or email me and ask me any questions. If you want to do a free consult too, to talk about this program, to see if you and I are going to be a good fit, feel free to do that as well. All the links are in the show notes. So if you want to do the consultation, it's free. I will hop on a call and we can talk it out. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Again, let me know what you thought of this episode. And if Cindy's advice and suggestions work well for you. Have a good day. Hey, Cindy, welcome to the Sober Vibes podcast. I'm excited to have you on today. Thanks, Courtney. I'm so excited. Before we get started, because I'm very, very, very happy you are on the show so we can talk about this topic because it's so important for so many women and men. Um, But before we get into that topic, when did you get sober? So my official date is November 14th, 2016. So yeah, that's my, that's my official date and it's been quite the journey since, but yeah, it was no big, I know that there's always this idea that it's a big rock bottom moment. Right. And for me, it wasn't a rock bottom moment. It was just a, I knew I couldn't do it anymore. So yeah, so that's my, that's my sobriety date. It is from alcohol. That's what I'm in recovery from. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you try quitting before that? Did you try moderating? Did you go through all of those? Oh, I moderated like the best of them. Like, oh yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. know, I think it was, it was okay. So this week I'm only going to drink on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or I'm only going to drink before I go to work on Friday and Saturday. I know that sounds funny, but I, that helped me when, before I went to work, like, so I think I, I connected those things. I tried to moderate for sure. And that was my, that was my gauge, right? Like, so Mm -hmm. if I could just moderate, that means Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. And I also, I lost my mom 14 months prior to me quitting and even her death from alcohol, like from alcohol, from cirrhosis was not enough at that moment. I was like, yeah, but that was her problem. That wasn't my problem. Like I just drink, you know, Grigio out of a black box. Like it's not a big deal. Like all my friends do. Mm -hmm. So yes, I did. I did try many, many times. And then it just, it was one moment. It was was, actually, I was presenting at a meeting the night and night before I decided it was my last drink. And I came home and I'm like, I can't believe I had to have three glasses of wine before I spoke at a meeting. When you talk about a meeting though, I just professional. Okay. I just want sorry for work. Like it was work. It was, it was a professional meeting in front of my colleagues. And Mm -hmm. I got home that night and I thought, this is God, something's wrong. Like that cannot be. And I ended up having a fight with my partner at the time. And he was like, this is just all like, this is it. This is the reason why all these things keep happening. So that Mm -hmm. was my, that was my moment. Like, and then getting up to your moment though, in like moderating and stuff, because I always feel anybody with an issue with alcohol or drugs, whatever, whatever mm-hmm. your, whatever your vice is. Did you know you had a problem even through the moderation as you just talked about it? Like were there parts in your journey with it where you're like, this is an issue, but you kept drinking anyways? I think so. I think there was an underlying fear that of calling it a problem. Yes. Because if I call it a problem, then what does that mean? Does that mean I'm an alcoholic? Because I did those surveys online and I'm not technically one, or maybe I kind of am. So yes, I think I definitely would. I was always chasing that and, and trying to answer that question. And for me, I was really comparing it to my mom's journey. My mom had also drank wine her entire life. Mm -hmm. And she was just shy of 70 when she passed. And she was young. To me, she was vibrant. She was, she, but she maintained this healthy facade of a couple of glasses of wine a night. And that's what I grew up on. Mm -hmm. And I didn't start drinking until my children were born. So I would say 
20 years prior to that. So I, it wasn't like something I had done my whole life and I wasn't like, it didn't be college days of getting wasted. Like it was just this, I actually started drinking with my mommy plate crew. Isn't that crazy? Oh no, it, I was just going to ask you, I was just going to ask you like now, you know, becoming a mom in through this process, he's six months old. I'm like, during those first couple of months, I'm like, I understand why women turn to alcohol during this. So is that, was it more, it was introduced, it was more acceptable in these play dates or sure. was motherhood kind of what took you, you know, dealing with any type of stress if you had the stress in motherhood to I drink? Think- I think both of it. I mean, my kids are now 22 and 19, mm-hmm. 20, yeah, 22 and 19. We're going to have to think about it. And it was acceptable. So, you know, I was immersed into the mommy, the culture, right? It was, we had play great play dates twice a week. You know, if they were an afternoon one and it was anywhere near four o'clock, mm-hmm. it was okay to pour a glass of wine. And I was like, Oh, wow. Well, I think I actually might like wine. Like I did, I really had been a big drinker up to that point. And so, yeah. And then as the kids got older, it was just embedded everything we did. We had Flamingo Fridays in the neighborhood and that was all centered around alcohol and soccer games where we had mimosas before soccer games. And it was in almost everything we did. The PTA fundraiser was some on um, unlimited bar tab and Birmingham silent auction. So it was all of those, like it just, it just was part of my culture mm-hmm. of what I was used to. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, my, and my, my mom did it. My dad did it. And then I think for me, it was when my mom passed that I was like, I, that's where I felt very also I was a hypocrite. So I was judging her. Like she died of cirrhosis. Like I helped take care of her for three or four years. And then I watched her and I was like, girl, you're doing the same thing. Your kids are going to go through this. They are going to end up taking care of you. Like you are taking care of your mom. And I think for me, that was my, that was kind of my big moment at that. At mm-hmm. that. So for sure. Well, and too, that's, you, know, you lost your mom at a young age. 70 is young. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, anything before 80 is young. I really, just, that's right. just how I feel. And as I get older, I'm like, I remember thinking 50 was going to sound so old. I'm 49 and I'm like, <laughs> Ooh, I was like, they're just so young. Like, oh my God, it's the best. <laughs> right, right. So, so, and that was a traumatic way to lose a parent. And then, so, yeah, so I can kind of see too, like in a grieving process, kind of what too brought you up to that point. For sure. For you know, sure. And, yeah. and getting more clarity around it. So when you quit, mm-hmm. what was your, how, how was your path of recovery? My path of recovery at the time felt super unique. I didn't know anybody who had quit. Mm -hmm. I, nobody in my circle, nobody in my family. And even watching my mom go through her process, her journey with alcoholism, you know, doctors kept recommending AA and she would never go. And, and me being like, mom, just go. It's not that hard. Pick up. It's a 1-800 number. You just call. There's a meeting down the street here. Right. Apparently. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. And she never did go. So I had no, I had no clue. I had no, I, I, I didn't know anybody. And there were no women my age that were admitting that they were drinking too much. And so I, my partner, he didn't drink, doesn't drink. I'd gone through a divorce about 10 years prior to that. And so he had no idea because he's just never drink in his life. So for me, I was like, what do I do? And so I honestly, my brother had recommended a book to me. He's like, cause he had been toying with the idea of maybe stopping because, Hey, our mom died of it. Maybe we should kind of look at, look at our own habits. Right. He had recommended Annie Grace's book, mm-hmm. um, this naked mind. And I was like, Oh, not a, okay. I'll read it. And I read in the second I read it, it just, all the light bulbs started going off, mm-hmm. but then I didn't know what to do with that. Like, okay, right. so I have this, I have this information now, what do I do? And so mm-hmm. I dove into, so it's going to sound crazy, but I dove into social media. Mm-hmm. I dove into Instagram and Instagram was where I found, I found sober people. I just, I, I actually started with Annie Grace and then I looked at the people who followed her account and then I started following all of those people. And the more I started feeding my mind with people who were doing it, had done it. And then I started reading all the books. Oh, this book, I mean, my whole bookshelf is just full of sobriety books. I started reading everything and that mm-hmm. was my journey. That, that was that was my journey. I didn't, I didn't do meetings either. I didn't start doing meetings until COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, 
that's when I found online meetings and mm-hmm. I started paying attention to like the She Recovers program. I started, they have, what are these weekly people meet daily and <laughs> talk about their, like, what is this? And the second I went to a couple, I was like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I started going to when Laura McAllen started hers, like I started attending her meetings. I'm like, oh, this meeting thing's kind of cool. So, but that was, again, that was three years into my sobriety. So those early days was all for me, was just all books books and Instagram. (laughs) I, yeah, I don't, I don't even remember having conversations. I didn't even know anybody who was sober. Right. Right. And then what, but you're open about talking about your sobriety journey. So once you started um, opening up about yours, did you then attract more people to you because of your sobriety journey? I think so, Courtney. I do. I think people started to, uh, I don't attract in good in an, in an, in an interesting way as well, because I feel like people weren't comfortable with me talking about it. Like yeah. they didn't, this isn't the Cindy that they know. Like mm-hmm. this is, oh, I remember Cindy. She used to really get it on back in New Orleans. I mean, but you know, so there were these stories. And so I think people were really surprised. I had a couple yeah. of family members who definitely said to me, we think you talk about it a little, you talk about it too much. And oh, really? Oh um, man. Yeah. And okay. so that just really kind of fueled me a little bit more, but I'm also, I was also my very to people pleaser. So I was like, Oh, maybe I am talking about it too much. Maybe that's not what you're supposed to do in sobriety. And then there was a point that I was like, well, screw this, especially because for 25 years, I've been in the field of sex ed. And so for me, I've talked about topics that aren't always acceptable. Right. And so this felt like a new topic that also wasn't acceptable to talk about. So here I am used to talking about one thing. And then now I have this other thing and how am I going to, can I talk about both of those simultaneously? So, yeah, so I definitely attracted more people, but I don't know. I, a friend of mine had asked me a couple of years ago, she, she had sent me an email. She said, Hey, do you have any resources on quitting drinking? girl, I got so many, (laughs) like, like, what do you, you know, I would tell your friend this, and I would tell your friend this book and this podcast. And and she said, it's actually me. And I was like, I was so surprised. I used to work Mm -hmm. with her. Mm -hmm. She's like, you're the only sober person I know our age. And she knows a lot of people. Like she's at the Mm -hmm. top of her industry. And I was, I was blown away. She's like, you're the only, and she's like, you're the token sober friend. And I'm like, huh. I'll take that. I know. It was like a new badge of honor. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll be your only sober, your only sober friend. And so, so I think it's slowly happening, but yeah, yeah it, it's out. two things there. It is when you hear that, when somebody calls you like the sober token friend, you're at first, you're like, what the fuck? But then you're like, well, I am because I'm the only one in, in this friend group who has the balls to speak out about this one. Mm-hmm. And two, isn't it funny how you can't talk about alcoholism and then you can't talk about sobriety? Like I just, how you just kind of spun that where you're like, oh, maybe I'm not supposed to talk about it. But that is kind of how the, that topic of conversation for both, it's just so hush hush and it's like sweeping Mm -hmm. everything under the, and under the mat. You know, personally, that's why I chose 30 days after I got sober. I'm like, I cannot continue to this to be a secret after all of the secrets that I've held in for so long. And then previous of family secrets and dysfunction, like, like, I want to be fucking free. So in my sobriety, I chose to be free. And but it is one of those things. It's just like it. And it's still hush hush to people. Still, it still is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even in my family, it was hard to, you know, you're going to talk about, you know, you're going to talk about your mom's death. Like how they, she, I mean, and I, and I have no, I have no problem talking because people don't talk about their parents either. Like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'll talk about my mom. Like she, you know how she died. And she did. She, I mean, and not to be all tragic, but she fell down a flight of stairs mm-hmm. and she had had too many glasses of wine. She was in you know, she had in-stage liver failure mm-hmm. for five years and she was like five, one in a hundred pounds. Yeah. And, and it just blows me away that that happened. And like, I, I actually have more people who say to me, I can't believe you talk about your parents, your mom's death, like your mom's disease. And I'm like, why wouldn't we? None of us talk about it. And the second you start doing it, someone's like, oh, I have an uncle who, oh, I have a dad who, you know, and so then I think that that conversation is another one that just, you know, your, it's your sobriety, but then we start talking about somebody else in your family, 
that has to work from it, then you start, it really can start opening things up and people can have that conversation a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And especially too, that's coming from your truth. Yes. yes. You know, my sister and I talk about this a lot because it is like a line of like, what do you say? What don't you say? But at the end of the day, we are chatting about my truth, her truth mm -hmm. of what we grew up in mm -hmm. and what we witnessed, you know? So it's not like people are not observant, <laughs> just, you know, sure, but it, sure. it all goes back to the disease of, of alcoholism and the drinking issue of just where you don't talk about it. You don't talk about it. And I think it makes, you know, and I mean, you probably, I know you've experienced this. It's like you, it makes your friends reflective of their own experience. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think, you know, my friend group ch changed dramatically. I lost some of my closest friends because, and not with intention, not with, oh, you're not drinking. We can't be friends, but it was this underlying, for me, it was an underlying theme of, well, I'm not being invited to anything anymore. Yeah. Right. And I only hung out with her at happy hour. Mm -hmm. And when we were at happy, like everything we did was centered around alcohol. And mm -hmm. so I really started to find that that was the center to a lot of things in my life. It was, it was connected to where I was working. Like all, everything I did at work was connected to alcohol as well. Mm -hmm. So when you remove that, it's just, it's all exposed at that moment. I'm like, okay, well, was that really a friendship based on our connection or was it based on we could share two bottles of wine and get it at 40% off at the, at the Italian restaurant. And we had an amazing conversation. Oh yeah. I was that it? I don't know. Or was it because we did it, you know, we drank before after soccer games together and that was our connection. Yeah. No. A lot, of, a lot of it is that that's a connection with people and they mm -hmm. don't, they don't know. I've had so many riveting conversations high on cocaine with people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man. So <laughs> transitioning now that you're kind of talking about work, transitioning into what we are going to talk about today. Why is it so hard for people in early recovery and sobriety to have sober sex and to approach intimacy? Because let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> I think because they're not used, I mean, they're not used to it. So I'll back up a sec. I, so my, my background's in sexuality education. Like I taught it for years, but I was also with a company that sold um, sex toys. Mm -hmm. And so my job for the company was to train all of these thousands of consultants on sexual health. Mm -hmm. Here's, here's the, this is what the vagina looks like. This is what the clitoris is. This is how you're going to sell this vibrator to stimulate this thing on this person's body. Like that was just part of what I did. And so for me, what I found is there was a huge connection in early recovery with telling people, I could, I see people struggling with, I don't know how to have sex in when I've just quit drinking because I've always had a substance before I've had sex. Like, yeah, it loosens you up. Like it really, you know, your inhibitions are lowered. Like it gets you in the mood. Like there's always a strong connection. I and mean, we could, I'm, there's so many conversations we had about, you know, the marketing, right. The sexualization of alcohol, mm -hmm. but there's, you know, so that's just been like, that's been filtered to us for so long. And so when you remove that, everything is just exposed. So, so I, you know, for myself, when I stopped drinking, I had to really think about, I have almost always had a glass of wine before having sex. I mean, I don't know. What was it like 90? So I'm trying to like think of these statistics in my yeah. head. I'm like, maybe 90% of the time. Yeah. So I'm having my own, I mean, it, you, you dig deep, right? You're like, everything's like, all the emotions are out there. Mm -hmm. like, oh my God. I think I've almost had, like, I always, like, I always have some type of alcohol before I've had sex. And so mm -hmm. to have that conversation then with my partner and tell him, Hey, I need to, I get that. That took a while. That took that was several weeks before I could have that conversation, but it is, it's, it's something we're used to. I think that it just it allowed us to relax. That's why I think a lot of people, a lot of women are afraid of that because you are, you're, you're vulnerable, you're exposed. You start thinking about, you think about everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's why a lot of people really struggle with it in the, in the early part of their recovery. And if not, not even just in the early part, Courtney, I think too, like it's something that has to be worked on. Oh yeah. I mean, intimacy and relationships, outside of sobriety, it has to be something that you work on, right? And it's, it's in a relationship. It just, for some, it, it comes naturally for sure, but there'll be, as we know, ups and downs. And so kids come along, death comes along, work comes along, divorce comes along, all these things. And so you've, 
you, it's something that challenges you. And then you throw recovery into it and you can't mask anything. You can't hide anything. And so that is allowing you to be exposed to your partner at the most vulnerable in one of the most vulnerable ways. And so I think that that's why we kind of like, we shy away from it or we're scared to talk about it. And what I found is nobody's talking about sex and recovery. Nobody. Why aren't we doing that? Like, and so, and I've been, here I am, I'm a sex educator and yeah. I can't even talk about, I don't even know who to talk to about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing online about this. There was a book I read and uh, I know Jennifer Matisse has been doing work on it. So I'm like, okay, well, I read some of her stuff and okay, who else? Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this a little mm-hmm. bit more. And maybe we can just, you know, maybe it'll open up more and more conversations about it. So I think that was a very, well, why don't you write a book about this? <laughs> It's on the list one day, I think. <laughs> it's on the list one day. I think it just, yeah, I think it's just about the comfort level. Like I, you know, for me, I have my own healing I've had to do about, you know, working in the industry of selling sex toys for so long. And, you know, whether I can spin that and call myself a relationship enhancement consultant, like, you know, it was with an MLM. So like you learn to spend these. You, well, yeah. you, you spend your title. Yeah. And so for me, like I have had to deal with, that. I've had to think about all the times I told women that they needed a little shot of tequila before they went down and gave their, their partner oral pleasure or joking about the flavor of the cream that goes on your clitoris. If it's a whiskey flavored, he'll be right down there visiting you. Like, Oh my God. I, I just, it blows my mind. To think, right. But I, like I, I did like, I, I, I taught that. And so for me, it's just that healing through that process. And, and you know, that, that in and of itself is probably a good book. All the stories I could tell about that for oh sure. Oh God. Yes. You yeah. have, you have two best selling novels on your, or books on your hands. Right. Like right. really, because <laughs> there really is not, there's not, uh, I'm just, sometimes I'm so bad with names, but I can see their like Instagram handle, but mm-hmm. there's another woman I know who talks about this. And then you, and I, it just like, there's just not enough information out there because then too, you get into the underlining, this is where it, it crosses like, and then you get into traumatic events that have happened to women with being For raped sure. or assaulted. And it's, it's so fucking disgusting as I sit here and we talk that it makes me see how much alcohol plays a part in the rape culture. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and that's something I definitely don't gloss over. Like when I'm working with yeah. a client, they can go down. If I feel like a client is you know, going through some traumatic you know, mm-hmm. recollection of their mm-hmm. past, like mm-hmm. that's a whole, that's a whole other, you know, I'm very much present and forward. And so that's why I have connections with therapists who are experienced with working with women who've experienced, have had traumatic events that now are affecting them. And so like, I can refer to that. I'm more the like, like, okay, let's give you some tangible things that you can work on now because Mm -hmm. you know, it does, you know, which kind of to back up to your other question about like the early stages. I mean, I think that everybody's recovery is so individual, right? Like we all do it different ways. We all feel different things. Our hormones are feeling different things. And I think just to honor that it can take weeks. It can take months for your sexual response even to get back to a place that is normal, whatever normal is, you may not even know what normal is because you've never experienced normal because you've always had alcohol mm-hmm. or another substance to kind of change it and, um, for you. So I think that just kind of recognizing that I think in the recovery community, we're always like seeking the answers and we're comparing ourselves to others. Like, well, how long did it take? How long did it take you to lose the weight? Right. Like oh, yes. did you lose five pounds or 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. And how, was it 30 days or was it 60 days? Um, how fit, how fast did your face clear up? Like when did your acne go away? When did your sexual desire come back? Like when did you start to like your partner again? We compare ourselves because it, it feels, you know, it, it's something that how we heal too. And that can be normal. It's normal human nature. But I think that we just have to recognize sexual response is going to be totally different because it depends on how much damage we've done. Oh, yeah. Um, And so once you get through that, I think then we can, you can start to go, okay, here's some steps. Here's some steps to get you through those early stages of recovery. Here's some things that you can do for yourself to kind of help you learn, learn about yourself so you can, you know, decide what pleasure you like. Yeah. So are you a believer? Cause my sister and I've had this conversation before. Yeah. Are you a believer of, I think I already know the answer, but I want to ask it out loud to you. Are you a believer of ripping off the bandaid and just 
having sex or like how what's no. because sometimes it's like how long do you wait because this also too like what if you're in a relationship when i got sober i was in a relationship that sexual part was it took me like a good year i mean it took when i say took me a year took me a year to be like comfortable in my own skin having sex like it took me a while and even too there was times i would just be like lights off please like because i didn't know how to be intimate with somebody and have sober sex i use sex as a weapon like you know so there's just a lot so kind of where are you at with that are you rip off the band-aid or go at go i think go slow i think i it, 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 maybe it, it, i for me, I think it depends on if you're in a relationship that feels safe and secure. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're in a relationship that feels safe and secure, then I think that process is a little bit different than if you are dating, if you're not with a partner and you're like dating, like that's just going to be a whole, that's a whole other world. And, and so I feel like if you're in a relationship and you're now early in recovery and it's still like we had said earlier, like it's exposing everything. It's exposing all of those thoughts, all of those feelings. You know, you're used to having alcohol that like really shut off that part of your brain that made you feel self-conscious. And so now all of a sudden you're self-conscious, you're thinking about all of the things. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's just, let's just do it real quick and let's just get it over with. You are having to almost retrain your brain and relearn all of the things. And there's a lot of new things that Mm -hmm. you may not have experienced or you're not used to, like you may not like touch. I always, you know, one of the number one things I'll tell clients, you have to find what works for you. So I I had a client one time that was really upset and she was maybe, I think like 60 days sober. And she's like, my partner still doesn't get it. Like he still doesn't know how to please me. I thought because I'd be sober, like he could do it now. I'm like, well, what does feel good? She's like, well, I don't really know. Like you can't expect your partner to know, even outside of recovery, this is for anybody. Like you can't expect your partner to know if you yourself don't know what feels good to you. And so I told her, like, you have to, have you, have you touched yourself lately? She's like, oh my God, no. Like, Okay. So what part so then that was a whole conversation about like, what part of your past is telling you that that's not okay. Are you open and willing to maybe, you know, you have to touch yourself. You have to, do you, do you know where your clitoris is? Like, do you know what your clitoris looks like? And so for her, she had like, oh, I'm not supposed to touch myself. So we had to work through some of that. So yeah, I do feel like once she was able to get through that, then she was able to explain to her partner, she's actually super sensitive to touch. And so she wanted him to do things to her that were slow and didn't like really kind of took care of her in a way. Like, and so I feel like it depends on the relationship. It depends on the dynamic you have with your partner. And if, you know, hopefully you have a patient partner. And I think that that's the thing is having that communication. Like, okay, I need you to have a little bit of grace right now and a little bit of, a little bit of patience with me (laughs) as I figure this out. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offers plant-based nutrition made with high quality ingredients. Each Organifi blend is science-backed to craft the most effective doses with ingredients that are organic and free of fillers and contain less than three grams of sugar per day. Like Organifi green juice with essential superfoods and a clinical dose of ashwagandha, it helps reduce stress and support healthy cortisol levels. Or Organifi gold, a superfood tea that supports rest and relaxation so you can wake up feeling refreshed. Each Organifi blend is easy to use by simply mixing it with water or your favorite beverage while on the go. And they don't compromise quality for taste. I do have to say also both of them are great for supercharging your immune system. Organifi takes pride in offering the best tasting superfood products on the market at a price that works out to less than $3 a day. You can experience Organifi as high quality superfoods without breaking the bank. Go to www.organifi.com slash sober vibes and use code sober vibes for 20% off your order. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com backslash sober vibes and use code sober vibes for 20% off any item. I use Organifi green and Organifi gold every day. The greens I use before I even drink my morning coffee. And Organifi Gold I use now at nighttime and I drink it like a, it's like a dessert for me now. I love it. It really does satisfy, for me, that sweet tooth. And I look forward to both of them every day. 
The link is in the show notes as well. So I made it a little bit easier uh, for you guys to go to instead if you didn't catch that information of the website. But again, the link is in the show notes and remember to use code SOBERVIBES at checkout to receive 20% off your items. Enjoy. Did sex change for you when you got sober? Yeah. 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 Sure. I think... Yeah, because again, I almost I had always had a glass of wine or two or three or something before I I before having sex, before being intimate. And I felt like it really put my guard down. I did have body issues, body image issues. Mm-hmm. I would, had gone through a divorce. And so I felt vulnerable in other ways. And so it really was kind of retraining my brain. And I will and I'm also a very big I need affirmation. That is my love language. And so I then had to be very honest with my partner and tell him and say, okay, I'm going to need a lot of encouragement and a lot of, I had to ask for it. You have to ask for what you want. You can't expect so many people expect their partners to assume and to know Well, he should know by now we've been together for eight years. Yeah. But I have to say this because when Matt and I did couples counseling, Yeah. That when you talk about love languages, the book, Mm -hmm. the five love languages, I think Mm -hmm. his name's Gary, sweet Gare Bear. So that is a book. If you're in a relationship, it is a book worth picking up to read and then have your partner read it because here's the thing. Your love language might be affirmations in touch and you want them to give that to you, but you're not telling them. And then, but you think that that's what their love language is and their love language could just be an act of service and gifts. <laughs> like, yeah. So that's where, and if you would read that book too, like that's why too with divorces, it's because you'd never like, not just because of that, but you don't yeah. understand each other's love language, which <laughs> once man and I figured that out, I was like, Ugh. This is so much fucking better. Like, but it's a game changer. It's again, I always tell clients, like, you have to figure out whether you agree 100% of it. Like, it's just a basis, right? It's not yeah. a rule for the rest of your relationship, but it is yeah. so good to know. Yeah. I always tell you, you need to figure that out. I even suggest you, they have it kind of tweaked so you can do it with your kids and figure out their love languages. Right. And I'm like, oh, when my 19 year old told me it, when he did it and he's like, oh, he was like, that's love language thing. Yeah, sure. And his was, oh my God, so much affirmation. It was like, yep, I could have picked that. And the other one was acts of service. I'm like, oh, I never would have guessed that about her. So I do think, yes, it's it's so important to do that. And, but it's also important to know that it can change over time and yeah. it can change with partner. And yeah. that's not something that's emphasized a lot in that book, but it can change. And what I've noticed, it was with my ex-husband, it was one thing. And with my current partner, it's another thing. And so then that feeds off of, you know, knowing that his is touch. I thought mine was never touched. Like I didn't like, if someone walks up to me at work and they like pat me on the back, I'm like, Ooh, like, no, no, like that's, you're in my zone. You're in my bubble. Yeah. But then like, I've noticed at, I don't know if it's age, but I also think it is a lot about sobriety is it's changed. That love language has changed. I need more touch from him. And I used to never be like that. So it can, it can evolve. And I think that is, it can be because of your relationship, but it can also be through recovery too, because you are now, maybe I, maybe I was doling, maybe the alcohol was doling my senses, which is what it does. And I didn't like people touching me because of other issues, maybe, but now I feel safe and I feel like, okay, when he touches me, it is a love. Like it, I do feel loved by that. So it can change through recovery. And as you get older as well. So, okay. Oh, that makes sense. Cause I feel like since having my child, mine has changed. And I think yes. I'm going to have to have this conversation. With Matt. <laughs> we're going to have to take the little quiz again. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it is, it is something like when you were just talking about like through stages of life too, of yeah. intimacy of like, even now just having a kid, like I told him a couple months ago, I was like, we need to figure something out. Like, you know, it's just because where we are, it's just, it's no longer the relationships, no longer about us. And that's where I was like, we have to get, we have to get this back into priority you know, but scheduling, you know, yeah, it it may be scheduling and that's totally okay. Like not, we, we kind of grew up on this premise that, you know, all this, these intimate moments are magical and they're, you know, they're created and they can be, Mm -hmm. they can be created, can be spontaneous. They can also be created in a way um, that 
works for you and your two kids, three kids, four kids, like whatever is going on, it's kind of curating a time that works well. And, mm-hmm. and that's okay to do too. Like that's, that's perfectly normal. And we all have to do it. We all have to like kind of put that importance on it because it is the sensuality and intimacy is what's going to keep you connected during those really, really tough times, especially because you are choosing not to, you know, dull anything and you're, Mm -hmm. you're not, you're not going to tune out. You're so, I think that that's even something more of a reason to kind of connect with your partner too. Right. Do you see a lot of, do you see a lot of sex and love addiction? I do. I don't work with a lot of clients that have that only because I feel like when you deal, there's a whole controversy in the literature right now about whether sex can be an addiction or not. And I've I've heard this. Yeah. So outside of that, and, and, you know, a lot of the scientists are saying, okay, well, no, there's really not a such thing as sex addiction, but then another school of thought will enter there. So I kind of stay away from that. I do feel like people can get addicted to behaviors. They can get addicted to things like being addicted to people and what those people bring to them. So whether they're a codependent, like, I think there's a lot of lines with codependency mm-hmm. that can be that are crossed that kind of look like love addiction because they want to, they want to be loved and nurtured. Like, and so I think for sure there is a huge, there's just a lot of research that still has to be done in that. I think we are just now into that era because people are starting to study it more and people are using those terms publicly more. Right. And so like, I have a love addiction. I mean, there's even a television show I'll called it. So I think we're starting to kind of, what does that actually mean? Can you actually be addicted to love? Can you actually be addicted to sex? And there's, it's almost like the same controversy sometimes with alcohol. Like, what do we call it? Do we call it an addiction or do we call it an alcohol use disorder? And so there was that whole kind of controversy for a while. So I think that with sex and love addiction, it's something that I feel like there's a lot of more research that has to be done on it for sure. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm interviewing uh, a woman about sex and love addiction right. and cause it's just a topic I've always been interested about simply for the fact of, I understand the bottom lines, but I'm currently reading her book and I'm like thinking to myself, I wonder how much women who have had drinking issues, because usually where there's one addiction, there's two to three. Right. Where this also plays into it or plays into one of those, you know, because usually for women, the next one, other than alcohol, it's, there's an eating issue or body image issues of all of that. So then I I just wonder, yes. Then I wonder about the love addiction, because as you stated, you're looking for these magical moments, right. To happen with your partner, but that shit's all in the movies and like what we grew up on. (laughs) Absolutely. And what was embedded into our head. And then you get into real life and then you're into a marriage or a partnership. And you're like, I mean, some of these days are boring. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. there's no, and then to like that, like push pull struggle of what you see in r- relationships or if it was meant to be. So I, there's just a lot under that umbrella of, of the sex and love addiction. So, but I didn't That's gonna be interesting. That'll be, that'll be really good. I, I, that'd be a very good conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but did you ever see that when you were selling sex toys? Did you ever see any, to- no. uh, did that topic of conversation ever come up? No. 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 I mean, I think there were definitely, you know, so what I, what I did, like the premise of the whole company was to like go into women's homes and put on like a Tupperware party. Right. And so, okay. so basically it's 20 women there. You encourage them to have as much you know, wine as possible, get them loosened up. So they buy more. And, you know, the conversations that had, you know, what I I had taught college sex ed before this. And so I thought, well, this has got to be pretty easy going into suburban homes and teaching a bunch of women about sex. And now you're teaching, you're just selling and you're dropping knowledge. Right. And so that's what, so for me, the people who were there weren't so much complaining about themselves. They were always complaining about their partner. Well, he doesn't do this. She doesn't do this. And so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear a lot of that. What I heard, what the biggest concern I felt like from women was more porn addiction. Like, Oh, he he watches porn all the time, you know, and that's not as that, you know, is that a sex addiction or is that like, is that a replacement for something? So there was that for me, I felt, I heard a lot more of that, just the use of the use of porn to please themselves. And so 
I hear that, but yeah, it was more, it was more to, to me, it was more intimate conversations about he's not doing this. She's, I don't know what to do when he does this. I want this. I want, it was more communication. It was more of this one-on-one dysfunction that women had at when I saw them. And again, my job was just to go in and be like, make make funny jokes and hold up a vibrator and go, this is what it's going to do. And it's going to stimulate your clitoris. And it's going to go whirl, whirl, whirl right up inside your vagina. Okay. And hope that you hope that you buy it. But what would happen, one of the reasons I kind of got burned out on the whole industry was that I loved, I hated the selling piece but I loved the education piece. Yeah, so yeah. then what would happen is each woman kind of come into like the order room and that had to be private. Right. So you couldn't just sit on the living room floor and take orders from everyone. Yeah. Because then when you have this private setting without all the women around you, they would come in and then they would say, okay, this is what I need. I actually really like it when he does this, what you have that will help with that. I don't feel like I have any feeling here. Do you have anything for that? Or he really likes me to go down on him. I hate the way it feels. I hate the way it tastes. Do you have anything? For that? So it was, those conversations were so much different in the private ordering room than they were on the living room floor when people are, you know, your friends are right by you and you still couldn't open up and have that conversation, but something about something about that privacy. And that's what I loved is being able to have those one-on-one conversations, but that didn't sell me any products. That was more, that's when I really learned that I liked the consulting piece. I liked the education. I liked coaching. I liked that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that sounds, I mean, yeah, I would have loved to go to somebody and have have that one-on-one space, you know, of just like, okay, because that's, do you think sex should be, it's like such a, it's just still a topic of conversation that nobody's really that comfortable talking about. Yeah. How do we, one of the things I've really been thinking about Liam is like, how do we learn about that? Like, especially do we learn it from our friends? Do we learn it from our parents? We learn it in school. No, no, no. Like we didn't have this big sex ed talk. And I was just talking to my 19 year old, who's a freshman um, in college. And she asked me to speak for her sorority. And I was like, Oh, I don't know about this. Like this might cross that mother daughter line, the, or this professional versus our personal relationship. Right. She's never heard me. She's never heard me speak. Like this just, I've always kept my professional. She knows what I do. She, she knows about my recovery that my kids are huge supporters. They obviously were around whenever I sold sex toys, which was crazy. And I hid it from them and I used right. all the funny verbiage for it, but she knew that I was, you know, she knows I talk about sex. And so it came up and her sorority asked if I would do a zoom meeting with them. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I don't, I don't, I don't know about this. I'm like, so I asked her, I'm like, well, I mean, why do you think that they want me to come talk to them? And she said, well, almost everybody there, they don't really, no, nobody really learned a lot about sex in school or anything. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm 49. She's 19. I cannot believe this hasn't changed since I was in middle school or I was in high school. And so I, I thought I was a pretty connected mom. And like, I knew that she, what her classes were and she hadn't learned it. And so I just kind of was this like moment where I was like this big light bulb, like we're still not learning about it. We're still not learning. We're learning about it from our peers and they're learning about it on TikTok. And so I thought, and then she's like, mom, you need a TikTok account. You need to like teach people about, you know, you need sex ed classes on TikTok. I'm like, I'm not doing TikTok. Are you crazy? And now I'm like, Hmm. No, do TikTok. Maybe Honestly, I need, maybe you don't need a TikTok. <laughs> yeah, no, get a TikTok because that is something that people need, but you can do like, you don't have to get up there and dance and sing that. I mean, that's what yeah. I thought you had to do. That's why I stayed off of it for so long. I mean, just sure. in the starts of playing around with it, but it <laughs> is like, you could give educational pieces out there in that for type sure. of content because it is true. It's like, this is where these kids are learning from. It goes straight to porn. So now it's just like, yeah. or whatever they're talking about nowadays, it's just like, there is no, you know, is there a sweetness talked about it right. nowadays? And that, that education, I, it's just, it is a topic of conversation that needs more awareness around. Sure. And our, my generation at ours, because we're different, <laughs> my generation, we didn't, they didn't talk about it either. And so then I think some of the clients I have, like, well, I'm not really sure. I don't know anything about this. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I know that I am, I'm different because I, you know, went to school for this. Like I learned about anatomy. I learned about sexual education and I'm, so I know that my education is different 
but it still it still blows me me away that we can't have these conversations even women in their 40s who are struggling with you know that they don't even know who to ask these questions of they don't really want to ask their girlfriend or they don't want to they don't want to google it and so there is a lot that we have to learn i think that that we're just constantly learning i love conversations about it because it just allows us to I know I could keep talking. I could keep asking you because then like, I'm thinking like religion has to get, because it's been so shamed. Oh my goodness. It has been so shamed, shamed, shamed. Yeah. Don't have sex till you get married. Oh my gosh, girl. I grew up church of Christ in uh, Southern Texas. And so I was, there's a whole, when I chose to, when I chose to do sex ed as my major in college, that was a whole like, Oh, I'm sure they were probably come back to the church now. And I'm like, okay, we'll be coming back to church. Right. <laughs> Oh man. Well, I could, I really could go on. We're going to have to have you come on another time to talk more about this because I'm sure that there's listeners there being like, I I need help with this. I, I just, I just know it. I know it, but can you please give the people of the good world? I'm sorry, the good people of the world, three tips on approaching intimacy with a partner in early recovery, early sobriety. For sure. I think, you know, definitely remembering that it's an individual process. So just keep that in mind through this whole time. So anytime there's like tips like that, just remember what works for you may not work for the next person. So I think I said a little bit earlier, about you have to learn what pleases you. And so that means, you know, telling your partner when their partner's gone, masturbating, taking time for yourself, finding a sex toy if it wants. Like, okay, I just need a clitoral stimulator. That's all, you know, 20 bucks on Amazon. Let's do it. Like if if that's what it takes, but just really exploring your body, being in- intimate with it. And I also feel like you have to focus on sensation. For so many times, people who are in recovery, we skipped the whole sensation piece and we're like, okay, I can get, I'm going to get crazy. And we didn't allow ourselves enough time to be still. And so now that you are sober, these nerves are more exposed. So a brush on the cheek, someone whispering in your, in your ear, someone lightly touching you when you're naked with with an ice cube. Those are things like, you're like, oh my God, I would never, but when you're sober, all of a sudden those senses are different now. And so kind of exploring new things. Like another one would be changing the setting. If you have always had intimate time with your partner in the exact same place in the house, you know, try to change it up right now because you are making a, you can be making a connection in your mind that, okay, last time we always had sex here. Like I always was so wasted every time. Like, oh, I've had like, remember that one time I fell off the bed. Cause I was so, <laughs> so let's try to find a new place, you know, whether it's the basement couch or it's, you know, uh, when your partner's that you know, his office when nobody's there, I don't know what it is, but you need to find like maybe a new setting that will allow you to not associate all those crazy drunken times with the one time that you're now trying to relearn things. And if that means turning off the lights, you said this earlier about turning off the lights. If you are so worried about your body image, try some new things, turn the lights off, turn the music up. Like a lot of people are more sensitive to sound. Mm -hmm. So turn, turn the music up, especially people who have little kids who are like worried someone might make up or some, you know, turn up some light music just to kind of put a little bit of a distraction in your head. Because again, everything feels, tastes, smells, sounds differently when you're in early recovery. And I think finally, for me, it's just, you have to be honest with your partner, let them know where you're at. And if you don't want sex right now, tell your partner, like, this is not about you. This is about me right now. I need some time. Please be patient with me. Let's not focus on the orgasm. Let's just kind of take 10 minutes to have some, just some exposed time, lay naked together, lay naked together and like explore your bodies, but know that orgasm does not have to be the outcome. Cause when you were, when you push that away, we don't think you have to have an orgasm. It puts so, it takes so much of the pressure off. Yeah. You have, I, you're right, just being honest with your partner. And in a lot of time, what I've heard partners want to know that it's not about them. Yeah. And to like intimacy, I've told Matt this before and he like laughs about it, but I'm like non-sexual touch. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's other things of forms of intimacy besides sex. So hundred percent, you haven't yeah. seen your partner all day and it's been 10 hours and all of a sudden, you know, that's just relationship one-on-one. Like you don't, that's just not, it's not a quick turn on, especially for for women. And so it's kind of reframing that. And so, yeah, I'm going to need to hear from you throughout the day. I'm going to, you know, let's try when you walk by me and, and it sounds, 
it sounds like you're very like scheduling it, but you know, you have to have those conversations. Like, man, when you come by me and you touch me like that, that just feels really good. And that doesn't turn me on. You don't have to use those words, but it just feels really good every time you acknowledge me, even if you're just passing by, if you just touch my cheek, or if you just give me, you know, tell me something beautiful about me, I, you know, whatever it is for you, telling them honesty, mm-hmm. the vulnerability, like this is just, that's the piece that you have to communicate with your partner. Like this is not, I am fully exposed right now. And I need you to be able to, you know, can you be patient? I'm asking for you. I need you to be, that's not so demanding, but I'm asking you to be patient with me right now mm-hmm. and letting them know, like, this is, this is something new. And I just really would appreciate your patience with this. And, you know, you're in a safe and loving environment, yeah, relationship. Hopefully your partner will respond to that and give that to you. Right. Well, I loved everything about this conversation. I really do. But I do want to ask you, because I <laughs> usually like to ask for some random question, but with you, I want to ask, because it's your expertise as well. Like what is the best sex toy for a woman if they want to start exploring themselves and getting comfortable with themselves and to, if they can use it with their partner? I would suggest a a clitoral simulator. I think if you've never used one before to, to use a vibrator that has both a clitoral and a vaginal stimulator on it, that's probably the one more, more, most people have seen that could be a lot. It could, and then the the last thing you want to do is scare your partner away or scare yourself. Like you get it in the mail and you're like, Oh my God, this thing is huge. I don't know what to do with it. It And it does 10 different things. Oh my God. So I think for me, I think like, and I I don't like the word bullet, but like a clitoral stimulator that can Mm -hmm. maybe have different speeds to it that you can then, it's not just for you. It can be used on the outside of the lady. It can be used it can be used on him. It can be used to stroke the penis. It can be used to stroke the outside of the testicles. It can be used to stroke, to stroke, you know, the out anywhere on the body because the body is just full of sensory organs. Mm-hmm. And so you want to be able to touch any part of it. So if it's a light vibrator, it can start there. So I think that that would be the one I would recommend just for lots of stimulation. It's not scary looking. And I think that that would be the, I would suggest that that'd be the best place to start. You heard no whipping out, no whipping out anal beads at this point. No, we're not ready for that. <laughs> no baby steps, baby steps. Well, thank baby you. Steps. Thank you so much for sharing all of your expertise. Of Where can people find you? I can find me on Instagram. I'm sober sexpert. That is my Instagram handle. And my website is cindyroberts.com and it's C-I-N-D-I roberts.com. Okay. And then I will put all the links in the show notes and then you can connect with Cindy and if you need help, reach out to her. <laughs> How much fun was this, Courtney? Oh my gosh. So this, good. Is, this is very fun. All right. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. Everybody keep on trucking and stay healthy out there. <laughs>